remember Larry's little sermonette. I get to talk and you get to what? Listen. See if there's anything worth listening to. We invite you to take your Bibles, please, and turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was in, engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. We've heard a lot of sermons on there was no room for him in the inn, and that is always something that stays in my mind. But what I would like to do, at least to start, is to say, when was the first time somebody told you that this is Christmas and we're going to have a birthday party for Jesus? Anybody do that? No? Oh, there's a few people nodding your head. We're going to have a birthday party for Jesus. Now, at least in some of the areas where I set foot, a birthday party for Jesus would be something that Jesus would not attend. And I noticed that over the years that what is going on is that they like to have the birthday party, but they don't like to have the one who's being remembered. And this is one reason why you and I gather together and spend some time looking at the calendar and saying, well, at least tradition says that this is the time of the year in which our Lord was born. Although some have said it's been as early as October, given what the weather might be. But nevertheless, this is the time when we have a birthday party for Jesus. Now, before we have a birthday party for Jesus, let's keep in mind who he is. And I want to spend some time bouncing off of this seventh verse to do at least a quick survey of some of the important things in God's word that reminds us who, is, who this baby is in a manger. Who is he? He's the source of all things. Everything and anything that exists, he's the source. Secondly, he is the sustainer of all these things that come into existence. And he is not detached from that which he has created and sustains. He is the sovereign of all. And as he looks at what we would call some of the defaults, he is the savior of all as well. So keep this in mind as we celebrate the birth of the Son of God, Jesus our Lord and Savior. But let's look at the first point, that this baby in the manger is the source of all things. Notice in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. This is who we are. This is why we are here. He is the one who existed. Before anything existed, he was there. And when things came into existence, he was there because all things have been created through him and for him. That they're my purpose in life, your purpose in life, is connected directly to the, the Son of God. It is directly connected to the triune God. We exist because God has said as much and we should at least find out what it is that is our purpose in life. And he is the one who has created all things through him and for him. And so when we have a birthday party for Jesus, let's remember the dignity of the one whom we are celebrating. Notice in the greatness of the galaxy, what do you see? You see the work of the baby Jesus. You see the work of the one who is in the manger. And I've always been interested in that, and particularly in the verse that follows, 
where he is the one who sustains everything as well. Let me jump out of the lineup for a moment and take a look at Colossians 1.17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Let's read those two verses in connection. Verse 16, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. We'll go back to that in just a moment, but I'm always curious about how that babe in the manger was still holding everything together. This is indeed a miraculous event that has taken place for your benefit and for mine. So as we look at the greatness of the galaxy, we see the powerful work of the baby in the manger. And we celebrate that as a part of the birth. But we celebrate that on even broader grounds than that. Even in the warped wisdom of mankind, you can still see the baby in the manger. Because in John 1, 4, John tells us, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Even though we try very hard as human beings in our unbelief to eliminate that which is moral, that which is ethical, that there is a difference between right and wrong, it cannot be totally done. They try to eliminate the light, but they cannot, because this is the work of the baby in the manger. He was the light of men. And even while he is in the manger, he remains the light of men. And when we celebrate the birth of the baby, keep in mind we are celebrating the one who has created all things and has planted in each person something of a conscience and a mind that can still think a bit of what is right and what is wrong. And notice in John 1, 3, all things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Anything you look at. We've been watching the nature series on the animals. And we like the cute little animals. We like the cute little lions and the cute little tigers. And then you go so another place in the zoo. And you better like the little lions and the little tigers because now they're grown up. And they are not as likable as they are as little kittens. So pay attention. There's things that have gone wrong in the creation, but you still see the awesomeness. All things came into being through him. And so I can take a look at the cute little tigers, the cute little lions, but when I see a scorpion walking across the floor or out in the backyard, I have a hard time seeing the cuteness of a scorpion. <laughs> but I know that in my new mind and in my new body, I will have an appreciation for the scorpion that I've never had before, nor will I have until that time. And you might be sharing those same thoughts. I'm not too real sure about that. But notice that all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. If you take the creator out of the picture, you lose purpose, you lose meaning, you lose value. It becomes things. You're a thing, I'm a thing, everything's a thing. But there is the presence of the living God. And the presence of the living God tells us that we have our value and we have a life that's worth living because we are to represent the God of the universe. And we represent the Imago Dei, the image of God. And whatever we do, in word or in deed, we do all to the glory of God. And that is a part of the birthday party that is a lifestyle to be lived. He's the source of all things, and he is the sustainer of all things. Again, let's look at Colossians 1.17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. It's, in, it's really enjoyable to watch some of the arguments that go on on whether or not there is a God. And I always enjoy the Big Bang Theory because at least... As I look at it, what I, at least when I was in school, it was wherever there is an effect, there is a cause. You don't have an effect without a cause. But the brighter minds of science basically want to have a big bang without the banger, as I've said before. And that seems to be a logical breakdown. And I'm the one who's illogical because I believe in Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God and the Son of Man, 
who lived the life, who died on the cross for you and for me, who was buried and rose again on the third day. How funny that is. And yet they can have a bang without a banger. I think I like mine a little bit better. The one who was on the cross was the one who created everything. And all of these things, he holds them together. It's no wonder he's going to call us all into account someday. What have you done with my creation? And above all else, have you enjoyed and benefited and been blessed by the new creation to be created again in the image of Jesus Christ? Notice Hebrews 1, 3. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. Notice that this is speaking of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the baby in the manger. Notice that he is the one that is the radiance of the glory of the Father. And if you see Jesus Christ and you know him for who he is, you have also looked at the exact representation of God the Father. And he holds up all things by the word of his power. They hold together. He brought it into existence. It isn't as though let there be and it flew all over every place. When he said let there be and it came in, it came in as it was supposed to be. And when it got there, it's supposed to be what it is and it remains that. Now, everybody knows that when it comes to tools like screwdrivers, pliers, hard things like saws, little hand saws. I have a scar here where I missed the wood and got the thumb. Uh, got a scar here because I missed the wood and got the thumb. That's how I am with tools. But notice that in this particular case, he upholds all things by the word of his power. I wish I could do that. My fingers and thumbs would be safe from such tools. As it is, I have to call on you people to come cut a piece of wood for me. Well, I haven't done that quite yet. But nevertheless, if the need is there, that's how it's got to be satisfied and filled. But notice when he spoke it, it came out and it stuck together. And because of my great use of tools, I can assemble like a tricycle, but I have no guarantee that it will stay together very long. But the one who receives the tricycle stands over dad's shoulders and say, dad, this is what you're supposed to do. This is how you're supposed to do it. Dad, it's supposed to be tighter than that. I think he was five at the time. And I'm not exaggerating either. But when it comes together, it stays together. That's what the baby in the manger did because he's the source of all things and he's the sustainer of all things. And thirdly, he is the sovereign of all things. Notice in Acts 17, speaking of the work of God as creator, and he made from one man every nation and mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. The most high God is the ruler over men, and he has designated his son to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. It is the unknown God who appoints the times and the boundaries of the nations. Many of us as Christians are a bit concerned about what is going on in our country. You better keep in mind that the only country that lasts is the kingdom of God. And what we need to do is pray for our country, but keep in mind that our concern and our heritage is in Jesus Christ, the babe in a manger. And he is the ruler over mankind. It's the unknown God who appoints the times. It's the unknown God who appoints the boundaries of the nations. And we know that this unknown God is not unknown to you and to me. It is the God of the Most High who rules over the realms of mankind. Notice in Daniel chapter 4, verse 32, as Nebuchadnezzar is being told of what his penalty will be, <clears throat> you will have a great vegetable plate to eat. You will be given grass to eat like cattle, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind, and he bestows it on whomever he wishes. Friends, read this regularly. You will be given grass, etc., etc., over a certain period of time until you recognize that the Most High 
is the ruler over the realm of mankind. We do not have a God who is tucked away somewhere in the universe and is removed from us. What we have is one who basically appoints the times and the boundaries of their habitation. And notice that he is the ruler over the realm of mankind, and this is it. He bestows it on whomever he wishes. Notice that our relationship with God is not a democracy. We have times for prayer, and we can bring our concerns to him. But well, the final word is that of the Lord. He is the king. He is the creator. He is the sustainer. He owns it. So what he determines to be real, that is what becomes real and stays real until the time is up. So in this time, let's keep in mind that the Most High is the ruler over the realm of mankind. And notice in Daniel 4.35, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? How many times have we and, or have we known people who basically is on the outs with God? There's a person I've been talking to over so many years and early on he would, we would agree that the one thing that he had in relationship with God is he was on the outs with God. He told God what to do and God said, no, thank you. But it took quite a while for this one to come to the point where he understands that you don't say to the God, what have you done? No one challenges his authority. And that is true with the babe in a manger. Let us keep in mind that the babe in the manger is the second person of the Trinity. And you don't say to him, what is it that you have done? The most high God is the ruler over men and the baby in the manger is the key figure. Speaking of that key figure in Daniel 7, 14, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. As we see people who worry about whether or not our nation is coming to an end as a representative democracy, and we hear people worry about it all along, what we need to keep in mind is to be concerned, yes, to pray, yes, but let's keep in mind that the dominion is given to the Lord and the kingdom is given to the Lord and all peoples, nations, and men of every language will serve him and his dominion is not temporary, it is everlasting and it will not pass away and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. In my lifetime in church and growing up and going to college and seminary, one of the big battles is whether or not Jesus Christ is going to come before the tribulation, in the tribulation, after the tribulation, and then establish the kingdom, and all the argument goes on. Friends, let's take a breath long enough and take a look. It's a good thing that we can argue over this because the one thing we agree on is the kingdom of God is real and nobody takes it away. And let's keep that in mind as we discuss these weighty matters. Notice that in Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, that the baby in the manger, he alone is worthy to do what he has been called upon to do. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. This is what the baby in the manger was called to do. This was a part of the everlasting plan. And it was set into motion very clearly when Jesus Christ came to earth for you and for me. And so notice what is going to happen. He alone is worthy to do these things with the kingdom. And he makes us. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God. And they will reign upon the earth. This is our future. This is what we have to look forward to. And so when we look at baby Jesus as the gift, that's what we need to do. Always remember 
that he is the gift. In the end, the baby in the manger is the author of history. Notice in Hebrews 1, 2. In these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And I like to focus attention on that term world for just a moment because this one is a different word than one that is used quite a bit. This speaks at least in part, it has the suggestion of not only the world, but the epochs and the seasons of which we would call history. That he is not only the author of the material universe, he is the author of history and current events. Everything is under the control of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In these last days, he's spoken to us in his son. This is the one whom he has appointed to be the heir of all things, and he is the one who made the world and the flow of history that will take in the flow of values and the things men and women do. He is the sovereign of all. And what does the sovereign do for us? He is the savior of us all. Notice that in Exodus 3, verse 14, we, God is speaking to Moses and he says, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. What a tremendous statement. He takes, you, you can't help but love it. He takes a verb and turns it into a noun. Now anybody who even made it through first or second grade knows that this is, there's something wrong here. But notice he took that verb and he made it into a noun, which speaks of the ongoing energy, the strength, the power. And he is the I am. Who he was yesterday, he is today. Who he is today, he will be tomorrow. He is someone to be relied upon. He is someone to be trusted because not only are his intentions good, but he has the power and the capability and the wisdom to follow through. And notice that in this case, I am has sent me to you. And when Jesus was walking the earth during his earthly ministry in John chapter 8, verses 58 and 59, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. And therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. They picked up stones to put an end to his life because he was claiming to be God. When he said, before Abraham was born, I am. He's claiming to be the I am of the burning bush who took the time to call Moses over and have a little desert chat. And notice that even before Abraham, who was well before Moses, this, this God was already there. And what do we see? It's Jesus, the baby in a manger, now of the grown man, said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. He's making the claim to be the God of the burning bush. Now notice for you and for me as Christians, Notice that we are called upon to believe that Jesus Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit, was given birth by Mary, and basically he was crucified, and then when he was buried, he came to life three days later, and after that he ascended into heaven, and there he makes intercession for you and for me. But notice what we have to, quote, believe. It's an interesting thing. Well, I'll not go into that. We'll share that with coffee sometime. That's going too far astray. But anyway, as I would see it, faith is a means of knowledge. And when somebody says, you're believing by blind faith, and I'm going to come back and say that even the procedures that we use for knowing today, namely science, has a foundation that cannot be proven. It is taken by faith. So I do not see that it's very difficult at all to say I can believe in science, but I know where the, fa where the foundations are and I know where the, the wall is and you can go no farther. And I take it by faith that Jesus Christ turned the water into wine that Jesus Christ raised Lazarus from the dead, 
that Jesus Christ came to life after the third day of a burial. And this is a source of knowledge. Can it be verified? Yes, it can be verified, and it will be. It has been by the eyewitnesses, and it will be when you and I stand in the presence of the living God in the person of Jesus Christ at the very least. And so let them pick up the stones to throw, but that doesn't alter the fact that Jesus is the I am of the burning bush. And he is the I am that existed before Abraham was ever born. And he was standing on the very edge of the universe when he brought it into existence. It's the baby in the manger who guarded his people of old. In 1 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them. And notice, and the rock was Christ. It was this one who was hanging on a cross who would say, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. This is the one who basically brought them through their time in the wilderness. The baby in the manger is with his people, and he builds his people. Simon Peter answered when Jesus asked, Who do men say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. He builds his church on the confession that Jesus Christ is the resurrected Lord and Savior and that he is the son of the living God. And that is the Christmas gift that the Father has given to you and me. And we should have a party, all right, but it is one that is worthy of the one that we honor. Again, the same idea in 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look at what God has done for us when we confess Jesus as Savior, and look at what we are called to do. We have a purpose and a real meaning for life. Things may change, but this does not. We are a chosen race. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are a people for God's own possession, and God's own purpose, and it is his purpose that we should proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, the light of life now and forever. And it is the baby in the manger who prepares his people. Now, wives, listen closely to these verses. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself a church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she would be holy and blameless. For those of you ladies who read your Bibles regularly, what passage of the scripture did I leave out? Wives, be in subjection to your husbands. Ah, thank you for that amen, as silently breathed as it was. But notice what husbands are to do, to love their wives just as Christ loved the church. And Christ gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. And notice that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. It is the baby in the manger who prepares his people. As we have, quote, the birthday party for Jesus, notice what Jesus does for us, that he cleanses us, that he is going to present to himself the church in all of her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Happy birthday to baby Jesus. But notice lastly, in Revelation 5, 
John says, then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, and might and honor and glory and blessing. The baby in the manger has done more for us than we could ever imagine. He came to us that we might be with him. So let's really have a birthday party worthy of the one. Let's praise him for who he is and for what he does. And so that we can stand prepared to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. May this be the time that we do this and may we always do this throughout the days of our lives. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we thank you that in the end, Jesus Christ is your gift to us. It's the gift of life everlasting and life abundant. And we pray, our Father, that we will always be filled with thanksgiving and that we will be used by you to proclaim the excellencies of him who is our Lord and Savior. In his name we pray, amen.